Good day, Grinder School. Uh, we're continuing on with our How to Master Heads Up Sit and Go series with Part 5, Aggressions. So, in this short, um, we're going to talk about aggression and how to effectively use it uh, in Heads Up Sit and Go specifically, but of course most of these principles, um, the general overlying principles are the same as any type of poker. So, um, we'll talk about a comparison of aggression versus passiveness and using aggression, baiting aggression, and controlling aggression, um, which is generally the same. So, um, to start out with, in general, you definitely are hard, a player is definitely harder to play with the more aggressive they are. Um, even a really bad aggressive player will often go on incredible heaters, um, just because they'll often when you're being aggressive and you're constantly jamming people or or uh, getting into big pots and stuff and forcing people to fold you're often increasing your non-showdown winnings even if you're playing poorly and, and taking a lot of unnecessary risks particularly if you're playing against opponents that are um, tight-ish and aren't willing to gamble it up right so um, even a horrible sputard uh, aggressive player will often have huge winning streaks from time to time even if they're overall a losing player and sometimes that could be frustrating even by itself because often you'll get the money in good against a really aggressive bad spewy player and they'll just catch up right so um, and also because you're forced to play uh, a little differently against them uh, you can often find yourself folding yourself out and getting a big chip disadvantage that uh, you know ends up when even when you get your money in bad or good or whatever, uh, you've already lost enough of your stack that uh, it makes a huge difference. So, um, in any day of the week, regardless of uh, stack depth or, or type of uh, hold'em that you're playing against, uh, a passive player is always more welcome than an aggressive player. Um, so when we decide to use aggression ourselves, uh, we want to try to maximize the spots where we're going to get a lot of folds. Um, we're also going to take advantage of any sort of aggressive image we have to get value from our value hands. And um, against competent players, we're going to balance those ranges. So uh, we might be doing overbet jams, as an example. Um, both for value and as bluffs and spots uh, to merge our ranges. Um, obviously, most of the money we make, though, is going to be against poor players, so we're going to have a tendency, except against stationary players, like against relatively fishy and predictable players, we'll, we'll be doing uh, overbets as bluffs, uh, unless we're playing against stations, and of course our overbets are instant value. So. Um, against another player that's being really aggressive we can often bait aggression one thing to note about that a lot of mistakes that I see people do is that they'll suddenly limp a strong hand even though they're playing against an aggressive player that's been jamming them up um, so often or raising them so that there's very little need to um, put your strong hands into a lower range i.e. limping um, versus a player that's going to be raising you up an awful lot. So keep that in mind, there's no need to, to get too tricky in baiting players, and uh, aggressive players tend to get even more aggressive as stacks get shorter. Also uh, controlling aggression, similar to baiting aggression, but what I I'm looking at here is sometimes you're the, the villain will be aggressive and you'll be trying to minimize their aggression with certain plays. Um, I'll get into an example of, of each of these as we're talking in some, some very specific spots that we use aggression. But in general, you should always uh, take into account when playing against an aggressive player uh, how to basically control the pot, which is an underlying pro um, principle in all poker, um, pot control. So controlling aggression basically relates to that. So, um, I'm going to start with an example of pocket pairs. Say you are 50 big blinds deep against a villain uh, who's a reg, 
and has a 3-bet percentage of approximately 30%, 28%, say, in this example. Um, we have 5-5, five five and we open for our standard, well, uh, a 3-big blind open. Um, I know that I talked about earlier doing a 2.5 here, but um, we decide to open for 3-big blinds, and the villain 3-bets us to 9-big blinds. Here, um, we shove... Um, we could actually do this as a default against most players because 50 big blinds deep, any pocket pair is usually um, going to be fine. Uh, against the villain that's opening 28%, uh, especially this deep, they are going to be pretty reluctant to call with a lot of the range, depending. And even when they do call, 5-5 five five actually stands up pretty good against that range. Um, so as long as we can perceive having some fold equity here, and we definitely have that. We uh, we can definitely shove a small pocket pair here, 50 big blinds deep, perfectly fine. Now, um, against that same villain, if we were 20 big blinds deep, we might try doing something like this. So we have 5-5 five five again. Uh, we decide to limp, and the villain raises us up to three big blinds, and we decide to jam over top of them. So in this spot, normally when I get into my short stack uh, portion of the series, I talk about how 5-5 five five here, 20 big blinds be, would be a standard open jam. And um, that's simply because we want to maximize our, our fold equity. But against a villain that we believe is going to be isolating really light, this might actually end up making us more money in the long run. Um, and it isn't necessarily something that I would do readless, but uh, against somebody with any level of aggression, this isn't uh, horrible. And again, 5-5 five five does pretty good against somebody that, that's going to bump up to three big blinds, especially if we believe that they'll have a bluff range for that. So uh, those are some ways to take in mind. Uh, keep in mind when playing pocket pairs uh, and maximize your fold equity uh, with them. And they're relatively strong hands where you will do all right post-flop, or getting them all in pre-flop, I should say. All right, so um, we're going to talk uh, briefly here about my pet peeve hand, baby aces. In this scenario, we're 14 big blinds deep, and we decide to limp with AC suited, and the villain jams, and we call. In spots like this, um, obviously, if you are limping a3 here, you're presumably trying to bait a villain into jamming into you. The problem is that a3 suited is at best a flip against your villain, the villain's entire range, including uh, their bluff jam range. So we really want to avoid getting into spots where we're um, f tricking the villain into jamming us with hands that have awesome equity when they would have just folded pre, uh, particularly this shallow. So you really want to avoid spots like that. An ace three suited is a really good example. Any any sort of ace with a horrible kicker. Um, Obviously, you know, we're we're not horribly done by against somebody that's going to be jamming their entire range here, but I think 14 big blinds deep is definitely too deep to be doing this with a hand like ace-3. Uh, we might try limp call at, like... To tell you the truth, I think that it's, uh, it's easily a jam, 14 big blinds and below. Um, there are certain villains that might be jamming us any two, any three cards that would fold to a standard open here, but that's a really specific read, and you shouldn't really count on it. And it's a pretty good example of how to induce poorly. So this is a spot we would not want to induce. Um, the final example that I really want to talk about here is playing. Uh, playing a hand in a more interesting manner, or a different manner than we might play against a standard opponent. Or uh, a better example, this particular hand is middle pair, and um, normally we w there's a pretty standard line we would take here with middle pair, but um, we're 60 big blinds deep here, and uh, it goes three big blinds, call pre, um, and the flop is queen 7-2 rainbow. We have 8-7 uh, suited uh, with absolutely no flush draw on the board. So, um, what are our options here? 
we can be check calling on this flop, we can be donking, and we can be check raising. Against a lot of villains, a check call here would be pretty standard with middle pair. Um, however, this opponent's very aggressive, and there are a lot of cards that can come here that uh, we're not going to really like seeing. Um, and so we really uh, won't be liking any sort of pressure that we get and we have to fold a vast majority of the time with our middle pair here. Um, another option we have is to donk lead. Uh, against a lot of aggressive players though, a donk lead might actually work better as an in inducing maneuver to to get them to spew off at you uh, simply because a lot of players mistakenly think that all donk ranges are going to be weak or I shouldn't say mistakenly because against a lot of players that's true but in any case um, we will probably want to avoid that so that leaves uh, check raising which seems a little bit unusual with uh, middle pair um, but against the player First of all, uh, against any player, for the most part, we might consider check raising here um, with top pair or better. Um, so there's certainly nothing wrong with us check raising with middle pair. Of course, we are losing value against a lot of the stuff that he would barrel with, but unfortunately, uh, we'll be put into a lot of spots where he's he's going to just be able to barrel us off. So we can elect for a small check raise here, and uh, a lot of the time. Uh, the villain will fold anything that doesn't hit the sport, which is the vast majority of his range, so um, it's definitely worth considering. And I think against uh, certain opponents, definitely the superior line to take. Um, and I'd say that check call might be a close second, but the uh, the problem with it again is that uh, there's a lot on the turn and river that could happen here that can really ruin our day. And um, what we want to accomplish here is, uh, especially against a villain that's going to be calling with with uh, a wide range, or again, a villain that's just going to flat um, when we check raise here, if they have a queen, um, we still have a chance to hit a uh, two pair on the turn as an example. So we do have some uh, a very s small amount, but we do definitely have some outs here. Um, we're essentially obviously just trying to take down the pot pre though, and we're hoping not to get callers. Our hand is relatively weak, um, and it's unfortunate that we have to play it this way, since against some players, uh, most players even, we would be check calling here with middle pair. Um, but because it's such a weak middle pair, and because we can predict a vast amount of aggression from an opponent. Um, it's definitely worth considering doing a check race here, and I think against a lot of opponents, the better move. Obviously, uh, we're going to try to keep our check raise relatively small, and also um, we are definitely folding to any sort of jam this deep, so that's why we have the option to put a check raise in here. And it gives us the advantage of having an aggressive image, which we can take advantage of later. The only time against an aggressive, a really aggressive player that I wouldn't do a check raise here would be if I thought that they weren't going to fold a vast majority of the time. Um, so yeah, you're definitely going for the fold here. So one thing that I'll mention uh, before ending this video is that a lot of mistakes people make when using aggression is that they decide to be inconsistent when using aggression, um, i.e. they'll try trapping with a pair of aces um, by limping in a spot that they normally wouldn't limp against a player that is often going to be raising them up or calling them for that matter. Um, <coughs> so this is often unnecessary. Uh, sometimes it's very effective, um, particularly when you're really, really low. But at the same time, in general, when you're the deeper you are, the less correct it is. Um, an aggressive player is likely to act out aggressively um, against a normal raise, so there's no need to limp ho in hopes of uh, of getting more aggression. Uh, obviously, against a player, a perfect player, um, who the perfect scenario where a villain is going to excessively raise up your limps like pretty much every time you limp 
And then that would be an exception, but it's, again, one of those perfect scenarios, and you need a, a pretty solid read to, to do that. Um, and also, while there's a lot of time when taking passive lines in order to encourage aggression is good, um, even with moderate hands, the um, when you know a, a player is likely to attack a check call type line, uh, thinking that you have a weak range is likely to attack it pretty wide. Um, while you can get value from uh, doing a check call line for three streets, you, m you must realize that you're often going to be using your whole stack and sometimes it's uh, it's way more worthwhile to try doing a check raise and, and uh, take down the pot right away before things get a little bit nuts, particularly on dry boards. So that's just another example of how we definitely want to be trying to manipulate the aggression of the scenario uh, and to take advantage of any of our villain's tendencies or try to control our villain's tendencies in order to maximize our profits in hand. So I'm going to end the video here. I hope that I left you guys with a lot to think about. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the forum and I'll make sure to address them as soon as I can. Thanks very much.